Hello, my name is Scott Davis, and I'm a member of Animal Advocate, Inc. Today, we're here with Dr. Will Tuttle. Hi, Will. Hi. Thanks for being here. Dr. Tuttle is a professional musician and composer, a lecturer, and an author. His most noted book is called The World Peace Diet. It's been recognized as the most important book of the 21st century. Its central focus is that the food on our plates leads to war and environmental destruction. In other words, what people are eating is at the root of the world's problems. The World Peace Diet is an award-winning book, now in its fifth printing, and Dr. Tuttle is here in Hawaii giving lectures on Maui and Honolulu, and Animal Advocate Inc. is very fortunate to have him with us here today. why your book, The World Peace Diet, has been called the most influential book of the 21st century? I think the reason it's been called that is that it's the first book that's taken our routine mistreatment of animals for food, and instead of seeing that as just sort of a peripheral side issue, it has taken that and brought it right into where I believe it should be, which is at the very core of our culture's mentality of violence that plays out not only against animals for food, and we're talking about a vast uh, system that's in place. Over 75 million animals every day are killed in the United States for food, so it's huge. But it's not just the violence towards animals. The, this violence towards animals, which is so vast, boomerangs in lots of fascinating ways, uh, back towards us as disease, as psychological illness, as war, as social malaise, as environmental devastation. And I really do believe that if we look deeply into the whole range of problems that we have as a culture, uh, we'll find that our violence towards animals for food is actually, I believe, the main core uh, driving force behind our other problems. So I think that's why it's been called the most important book is that it's the first book to actually address this issue which in many ways is covered up because we don't want to look at it. There's a subtitle on your book that reads Eating for Spiritual Health and Social Harmony and that's interesting how can eating manifest a healthy human spirit and a harmonious society? This, I could talk a long time about this um, but the basic idea here is that Food is an intimate act. I mean, food is uh, not only in, in our most intimate and powerful, profound connection with nature and with the larger order, uh, it's also our most intimate and powerful connection with our culture. And so, because we're eating so much violence in this culture, so we're, we're confining and brutalizing so many millions of animals every day, we tend to not want to look at that, which is understandable. We don't want to. We don't like, we're very uncomfortable with the violence towards animals that we, we pay for when we buy um, meat, dairy products, and eggs, and that we, in a sense, force our brothers and sisters to inflict on the animals, the people who work in slaughterhouses and so forth. So we don't want to look at that, we don't want to be aware of it, so we disconnect from it, basically pretend that it's, that it's not happening. <laughs> So we just blithely eat burgers and hot dogs and cheese and eggs and we eat ice cream and we eat all these things. We don't realize the violence that's involved and that creates within us a, a deep split. It's the split of being friendly, nice, caring people and on the other hand paying for horrific violence towards mainly female animals actually, the, the um, systematic forced in, uh, impregnation of, of animals, the stealing of the babies, the hyper-confinement of these animals, and the killing of these animals, and the, the whole horror of that. If I sow seeds of imprisonment and terror and fear and violence and, and devastation, how can I expect to live a life of harmony and peace. For those who may not know, what is the definition of a vegan and veganism? When I said a plant-based diet, um, that is close to being what vegan means, but actually vegan, the word vegan means eating a plant-based diet for ethical reasons and not just a plant-based diet, but basically clothing, entertainment, you know, in general, making the effort to live my life in a way that, re that minimizes the amount of violence I'm causing. The, 
the literal definition I will just give because I think it's interesting. Donald Watson coined the word vegan in 1944 and he said, Veganism is a philosophy and way of life which seeks to exclude as far as possible and practical all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. And so what veganism is, I believe, is a reiteration of an ancient idea that has permeated human culture. Uh, it's been known as ahimsa, which is an ancient Sanskrit word that means nonviolence. And the basic teaching is uh, of ahimsa and really of veganism that we will never find happiness, fulfillment, peace, uh, harmony as long as we're being violent towards others. We will never be free as long as we're imprisoning others. Veganism is the essential spiritual teaching of all the religions that as you sow, so shall you reap. Whatever you put out will come back. Therefore, act in a loving, kind, compassionate way if you would like to be treated in a loving, kind, compassionate way ultimately. Mm -hmm. And uh, our culture, I think, has lost sight of this. So veganism is a tr profoundly revolutionary idea, right. but it's also a very homey idea. I think it's when we come back to our own true home, uh, to the heart that we all have of compassion and kindness for other beings, then we're just naturally drawn toward veganism. And so it is this all-encompassing sort of revolutionary idea. Um, would it be right. fair to say that veganism is basically, a, in a sense, a rejection of everything that society has taught us and that we've come to know? Our culture does have you know, teachings that, that encourage our, you know, us as people to be kind and compassionate to each other. However, um, it is against everything our culture stands for in terms of its routine mistreatment of animals for food, I think. There's this underlying idea in this culture that certain animals were just put here for us to use, that they don't have a purpose other than the purpose that we give to them, especially pigs, chickens, cows, turkeys, ducks, geese, fish, you know, animals that we're eating routinely, those animals have interests but we don't uh, recognize their interests. So I, I think you're right. I mean, I think for these animals, what veganism is, is a profound, profound questioning of these core values of this culture. I mean, this is something that is so painful for, for us as, a, as human beings to look at, the, the, the violence in our food system. I remember hearing, for example, Joseph Campbell, he was a great mythologist and he gave a series of television interviews with Bill Moyer, a television journalist, and it was all about world mythology. And at one point Bill Moyer asked Joseph Campbell, so what is the reason that we human beings create myths? And he said, you know, if you look overall at all the myths in the world that human beings have had in all these different cultures over the centuries, over the millennia, if I had to boil it down to one main reason, it would be to somehow rationalize and justify killing animals for food. You know, that this, from the very beginning, has been something that has horrified us, that we don't, we don't feel good about, to actually stab animals, to kill them, to eat their flesh, to steal their babies. We naturally don't feel good about, and so because of that, we try to cover it up, and we don't talk about the violence in our meals. And I think it's a testimony, really, to this, the essential truth that we human beings are nonviolent. We, I mean, otherwise, for example, you know, soldiers wouldn't get post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? I mean, they would, they could do violence and horrible things to people, and they wouldn't bother them. They'd say, oh, no problem. But we feel terrible about it. It drives us crazy because of hurting others. We don't. We are very uncomfortable with violence, and it's our true nature. Is the wisdom of the interconnectedness of all life and the this, this sense of compassion and kindness that we share. And this is what our meals betray. We are, in a sense, I think, betrayed by our culture. And then you mentioned uh, just a minute ago about how you reap what you sow. Can you explain to in a little bit more detail? Right, whatever uh, seeds we plant will come up. You know, we know that. And so when we plant seeds, for example, of obesity. You know, one of the points I make towards the beginning of the World Peace Diet is that all of the problems that we're facing as a culture, we are inflicting on animals routinely for food. We are sowing seeds of these very dilemmas that we have that we cannot solve, and we cannot solve them because we're inflicting them on others. The obesity epidemic is a perfect example. There's many examples. We look at the obesity rate going up, and we see that we are inflicting obesity on animals because they're sold by the pound, we give them special feed and special drugs to make them as obese as possible, as quickly as possible, so that we make the highest profit on them, and then we 
find that we ourselves get obese. Sow the seeds of osteoporosis by forcing cows to overproduce milk. And so since there's a lot of calcium in milk, they're chronically losing calcium and they have severe osteoporosis when they're sent off to slaughter when they're only four or five years old. So these are animals that are forced into severe osteoporosis. The slaughterhouse workers say that they can break cow's bones with their bare hands after they slaughter them. So this is something I think we have to realize. We, we plant seeds of osteoporosis in cows, also in hens for, for eggs. We reap that in our cells. We sow seeds of the breakdown of the family, for example. We sow seeds of drug addiction, of drug use. Um, there's so many drugs that are forcibly inflicted on these animals. Teenage pregnancy, for example, these are all animals that are forced into pregnancy when they're just babies or just very young. Um, we sow seeds of war and terrorism, of environmental devastation, of disease. Uh, all the things that we are experiencing and that we just don't seem to be able to solve, we are actively inflicting on not just hundreds or thousands, but billions of animals every year. So this is a vast uh, enterprise that we're engaged in, and the suffering that we're causing is incalculable. I mean, you just can't even imagine the suffering of billions of animals who are hyper-confined, where they can't move or turn around very often. Uh, they have lives of despair and misery. And then we not only pay people to inflict this horrible misery, which is bad for these people, we then actually eat this stuff. We actually take this and put it into our bodies. We give it to our little children. How could we expect to not uh, suffer the effects of this? It seems to be a central focus of the book is the interconnectedness of all life. Some people, they may think that you might mean that we all came from one single-celled organism originally. In terms of evolution, we're all interconnected, but is there something beyond that as well? The spiritual traditions of the world have looked at life as a manifestation of, uh, of some kind of consciousness. And this may be hard for people to understand because, again, we're raised in a culture that's materialistic in the sense that we believe that if you cannot measure and quantify something, that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that materialist viewpoint is, a, again, is another result of killing animals for centuries for food. Every living being on this planet has a purpose. If we look deeply into any living being, we'll see that they have uh, a whole variety of intelligences that are working in their body, that in the intelligences that allow all of the systems of their body to function. They have inner feelings and drives. How do we know what it feels like to be uh, a chicken who is nesting with her babies and then protecting them? And I mean, there's a whole reality. They're experiencing their lives. How would we like it if someone looked at us as just a mere piece of meat and thought we were just, you know, a thing to be eaten? All animals have a purpose. They all have a, a sense of themselves as the subjects of their lives. And so this is the interconnectedness of all life, is the the profound, ecologists know this, this planet and all life is interconnected at the deepest level and the welfare of all beings is interconnected. And so when we, um, when we somehow separate ourselves from that, we in a sense create a, a form of insanity where we start to damage others, we start to destroy the communities of life and we end up destroying our own communities and our sense of connection and solidarity with the larger order. This is something I think, in many ways, somewhat hard to understand it with the head. You know, our, if, we, if we go into nature and we feel our interconnectedness with the larger order, no one needs to explain that to us. We feel it, we know it, it can happen. And if we don't understand it, we just look at a forest in terms of board feet and height on and make a profit. That's, that's devastation and we will end up destroying this planet and destroying ourselves. And how did this all begin? Uh, maybe 10,000 years ago in Iraq, or...? That's what... Yeah, funny you should ask. I mean, according to anthropologists, when they look back and try to figure out when people started for the first time owning animals as property, it seems to have started in what is today Iraq, as you said, around eight, between eight and 10,000 years ago. And it was first wild sheep, and then wild goats, and then about 2,000 years later, wild cows, cattle. And this, I believe, was the last great revolution that this culture ever experienced because what up until that time had been 
actually felt by people as being mysterious cohabitants of the world with us. These animals who were respected became reduced to being mere property. And when that happened, it set a whole chain of events into effect where women's uh, status was reduced, the status of all animals was, was reduced, not only the animals that were used for food, but other, all the other animals became um, basically seen as, as um, nuisances or as pests that could interfere with the capital, the, the property of the people who owned these animals. A wealthy class emerged that owned these animals. These animals, like the uh, sheep and goats and cows, were the wealth. War began happening as a way to increase wealth and as a way to consolidate power. I mean, look at it today, people, I think, who are somewhat savvy understand uh, in many ways that war is a method of the power elite uh, increasing its power and wealth. And this is what started happening 10,000 years ago. And it was a very slow revolution, but it did take uh, place. And this culture spread throughout the Mediterranean and throughout um, it's really spreading throughout the entire world, and we're born into that culture today. So I have a whole chapter in the World Peace Diet that goes into that more in depth. It's, it, it takes a while to kind of wrap our minds around this, the history of this, I think. But it is very helpful, I think it's very empowering and very liberating to understand how much of our problems that we're having are culturally driven. You know, that we're born into a culture that has an obsolete mentality of violence and commodification of food animals. And if we change ourselves, we can change our experience of life on this planet and we can create a culture where peace and sustainability are actually possible. We've oftentimes reduced an animal rather than a he or a she to an it. There's even our own household pets and companion animals. Does that make it even easier for someone to commodify an animal by referring, seeing them as an it? Yeah, I think it's really a good exercise uh, for anyone to just um, practice removing that word it and replacing it with he or she and think of to think of beings as beings rather than as its as objects some people including myself um, especially before I was a vegan um, I believed that you know maybe a utopian society is not possible because as you have mentioned we have innate compassion within us but perhaps humans might also have greed or selfishness and how do you think the compassion may outweigh it, or how does that play? Well, you're asking a very um, profound question. We are, at a very deep level, conditioned by our culture. When we're born into a culture, we're like a little sponge. You know, we just are enormously skillful as little babies and neonates and infants growing up at just soaking up the language. You know, so they're becomes my language, their food becomes my food, their attitudes become my attitudes, their religion becomes my religion, you know, their outlook becomes my outlook. This is what happens. I think it's very important for individuals in this culture to, what I re to do what I refer to in this book as leaving home, which means to you know, question the underlying assumptions of our culture. The this underlying assumptions in our culture lead very powerfully towards, what were the words you used, greed? Uh, selfishness? Selfishness. I mean, consume a lot and really makes a big footprint on the earth and really buys a lot of things and creates a lot of chaos, basically. And these are the people that we really honor. They're the, the big consumers. We have it backwards in this culture. And so I think um, the spiritual life that we are, I think, on some level, probably at our most essential level, uh, called to live, requires us to question these values. And so I think what veganism is, as on the surface, the first step really is to stop eating animal food, stop you know wearing and buying leather and things that are tested on animals and things that cause animal suffering. But that, in a sense, is just the beginning because what we're called to after that to treat everyone with respect, to listen to people, to honor them, uh, and to have compassion f for everyone. That that's really what veganism is, uh, what nonviolence is. And so it means the, the process of sort of pulling out of ourselves the um, attitudes that in many ways have been injected into us by our culture of self-centeredness, of greed, in this culture we're better than other cultures, and that kind of, of attitude, and to, um, to try to adopt a mentality of protection and blessing others, that this is where our real happiness comes from. Do you believe that meat 
is an addiction, as well as the dairy products? And if so, um, how would someone be able to overcome an addiction that is so deeply rooted within our society itself? I think they are, in many ways, mainly emotional, psychological, social addictions. I think primarily, and it's very deep, it's very powerful. I think, uh, sometimes I say it, you know, I think it's a miracle that someone actually is able to go vegan in this culture because the, the programming is so intense. I never questioned eating animal foods. I had no, I didn't have this vegan uncle or something that kind of was different. It was just everywhere, you know, my, my ministers and my teachers and my family and the government and the media and the, you know, everywhere I looked, certain animals were food, absolutely essential. Like they, those animals don't have a soul like we do. They're inherently inferior to us. God just put them here for us to use. You know, this is, there's this whole sense of being uh, utterly uh, above. You know, other living beings and so I think that's the essential dilemma that our culture finds itself in and why it's so difficult for us to um, break the addiction we we've had our you know when I came home from school and I smelled the pot roast that meant my mother loved me you know and if I come home now and I don't smell a pot roast I smell some you know tofu baking or something Wow, well, you know, my mother, where's my mother loving me? <laughs> it's missing until, you know, until we, we replace those ideas. So I think if we find ourselves awakening to be living a more compassionate life, we, it is in a sense like you know, breaking some old addictive habits. If one country, let's say, became very compassionate and sort of adopted this idea of veganism, uh, would that work well in the global economy and the infrastructure of the world? That country would take over the world, I'm sure. <laughs> I think, I mean, economically. I mean, if a country went, I think if a country went vegan and they had a consciousness about it, the people would be a lot healthier, uh, their thinking would be a lot more clear, their policy would be a lot more sustainable, their economy would be much more healthy. You know, they, they would, I think, begin to become a real healing force in the world. See, the thing is, uh, we have a, a situation today in the world of, of sort of an economic colonialism where large corporations make huge profits from devastation. You know, there's huge profits in war, there's huge profits in people who are sick. And so, and those countries that have, where, you know, where these large corporations are, have large militaries that go into the rest of the world and try to bring McDonald's and Burger King and ConAgra and Monsanto to, these, to the rest of the countries to try to create the same system around the world, which is a system of oppression and exploitation of animals, of the earth, of ecosystems, and of human beings. The most wealth, unfortunately, for, the, for, the, for this powerful elite comes from sick people. So I think um, if countries really somehow if people in countries yearn to become more free then adopting a more vegan diet will will help them to get out from under the thumb of these large corporations and um, I think that's really the only way in this at this time that we'll be able to create a, a world of sustainability and peace we will every other effort will be merely ironic because um, we'll be wanting for ourselves what we, what we refuse to give to others. You know, we want to have peace for ourselves when, and we refuse to give it to animals. So um, I think it's a very interesting question. I can give a couple of examples. Cuba is a very interesting example. When we blockaded them and they couldn't get pesticides, herbicides, fungicides and other things, they turned to organic gardening and they turned to small-scale local organic gardening. They now have in, in the whole of Central and South America, the highest levels of literacy, of health. It's a country that, that is done very, very well. They eat a much more uh, locally grown plant-based diet. And another thing that's interesting, in Russia, right at the very end of the, um, of the Soviet era, they passed a law there, and they gave about 30 million families what's called a dacha. A dacha is a quarter of an acre of land between a quarter of an acre and half an acre of land to just grow a garden outside the city. And this t has taken off. And now the dachas in Russia are supplying between 70 and 80 percent of all the vegetables and fruits and nuts and potatoes of Russia. They're not coming from commercial agriculture. They're coming from people's just little gardens. People are growing them and, the, and they're much higher quality. The people are much healthier. 
it's an incredibly positive movement. So I think any country that starts doing this, you know, encouraging people to eat a more plant-based, local, organic food will find enormous results. Okay. Yeah. You have traveled to a lot of different places, and what are some of the things that the other countries in the world are doing to help this uh, movement? People are starting to make the connection between global warming, for example, and animal agriculture. The, the driving force, the number one cause of global warming is animal agriculture, uh, not just because of carbon dioxide, uh, but nitrous oxide is 300 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide and it's cr is a byproduct of animal agriculture and methane is also a byproduct of animal agriculture which is about, scientists argue about this, but between 20 and 60 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas. Animal agriculture has been implicated as being the driving force behind global warming and you have um, Taiwan, for example, uh, in initiating a, a campaign called the No Meat, No Heat <laughs> campaign and getting a large, I think there are over 10% now of Taiwanese have vowed to, get, to not eat any meat. You know, that's a pretty high percentage in order to stop global warming. I think we have to see that it's important to conduct a, public, a mass public education campaign to encourage people to eat less animal foods, to reduce the amount of animal foods they're consuming if we are serious about saving this planet from environmental devastation. So there are things happening Unfortunately, the pressure from the large corporations is pretty strong uh, on other countries. I mean, China is eating more meat now than they used to. India is eating a lot more meat than they used to, mainly because of the introduction of uh, McDonald's and Burger King and ConAgra and Smithfield and Purdue and these huge animal agribusiness uh, enterprises are flooding the local markets with animal flesh and causing more starvation in the process. So I think as Americans, we can make a big change. If we begin to change, we are in many ways still a, the culture that the rest of the world looks at and emulates. If we can reduce the amount of meat we're eating, I think you know, the rest of the world will take that very seriously. I think you already touched on this a little, but uh, sometimes compassion might seem like sort of a sissy word, especially for the male. And how, how does the gender role play out with that? And um, how it's portrayed in pop culture and the media being a compassionate individual. You're right. I mean, I think that our culture, and I explain it in the, in the book, uh, in the World Peace Diet, how um, the role model for boys to follow, I think when, this, when uh, this culture, this obsolete hurting culture, as it spread, um, the role model became more and more of the, the hard, tough uh, male, disconnected from his natural feelings of kindness and sensitivity and compassion, uh, capable of sustained violence and cruelty towards animals and towards rival herders, capable of castrating and killing animals, uh, fighting and killing other human beings. Um, that, that became the role model. It was kind of the sort of the cowboy mentality, actually, the sort of uh, you know, John Wayne mentality, this hard, tough, disconnected man. Um, but I think we all know that that is a devastating force on this planet. There's probably no more devastating a force than that of men who are disconnected from their natural feelings of kindness and compassion, uh, let loose on this earth, cause enormous suffering and violence. And um, this is really the type of male <laughs> mentality that's uh, required in animal agriculture. You know, from the very beginning, I think animal agriculture has been very different from plant agriculture. That that there's a, a thing about growing plants that was typically mostly women's work and brings out the best in us in the sense of working with nature and with the cycles of life and with the, the abundance and uh, creativity of life. And in animal agriculture basically was men's work. It was uh, always working against nature, against the, the desires of the animals who wanted to live their own lives and be free of human interference. And so today, I think we do plant agriculture pretty much the way we do animal agriculture. You know, we, we try to kill all the insects and, and any other animals that are there. But that creating gardens makes us much happier. And I think women and men both love men who are kind and compassionate. I think these are the people we naturally emulate within our hearts. 
How should a vegetarian or a vegan person approach and think about those who are not yet vegetarian or vegans? There are two kinds of people in the world. There are vegans and there are pre-vegans. <laughs> and the idea that, you know, eventually everyone is going to become a vegan. Eventually, this is our true nature. Eventually, it's where we're all going in this life or sometime, you know, eventually. And um, so I think the most healthy relationship that we can have with others is respect for them and understanding. And to also realize that there's no one who's eating animal foods, which is pretty much most of the people, obviously, in the culture, who did, is doing it from their own free choice. You know, no one is doing it from their own free choice. Everyone who's eating animal foods, everyone who's eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, are doing that because they've been forced into it by their culture, by every institution in their culture. They're doing it simply because they've been programmed to, and they're they're just acting out a program. They're just basically a programmed robot, you know, in the sense of just doing what they've been told to do. Growing up as little kids, we get baby food jars that contain veal, chicken, turkey, beef, cheese, and other things, and we just trust every you know these giants are around us to give us the right food and we eat that and we and the older we get the more we eat and then as we grow up we find it's it's just from every dimension the um, the other thing is that we're disconnected typically from what the foods actually are because that old advertising gimmick that was used when they talked about uh, burgers growing in burger patches you know that idea that the burgers are kind of like apple you just pull one off a tree you know <laughs> and uh, the sense that there's no violence involved, that it's really okay. And we present the, the flesh of animals in styrofoam and plastic like it's just a, it's a commodity. So I think that's the best thing, just to, just to talk to people in a way that we're on the same side. You know, we're all wanting to live, create a more, to live a more harmonious life and to create a more sustainable, harmonious culture. And the way to do that is to understand uh, where these habits that we have come from. Some people might say it's too expensive to be to buy vegetarian foods and vegan foods. So how could someone could you explain how could someone become a vegan on such on a meager means? That's another great question, but basically meat should be way more expensive. I think everybody knows that. I hope everybody knows that. I mean the, the subsidies to the meat dairy and egg industries run in the again in the hundreds of billions of dollars and they're they're enormous. I th they're uh, both expl explicit and, and a lot of them are very hidden, but all the, the huge subsidies for water, for f um, price supports, and I have a whole list of them in the World Peace Diet. The estimates of the average cost of a hamburger usually are around between $30 and $70 per, you know, per pound rather than what we pay. So you know, the price is much less than it should be, and we all pay for that through our taxes and through the ill health of people who are eating animal foods. That, osteoporosis and diabetes and cancer and heart disease and strokes and kidney disease and liver disease and uh, arthritis you know all, all the diseases caused by animal foods which are pretty much the diseases that our culture is faced with are all very expensive and uh, so it's extremely inexpensive to be a vegan in the sense that I mean I haven't paid for health insurance in 30 years I haven't had to use any health insurance um, the foods themselves ought to be much less expensive, and, and in fact, they actually are. I mean, you can live on, if you're buying grains and beans, it's very inexpensive compared to, you know, uh, meat, cheese, and eggs. And uh, it's high quality protein. You know, organically grown vegetables and fruits and nuts, I think, are a good part of the diet. But again, if we eat, Unprocessed foods, whole foods, in their natural state, which is what I really strongly believe we should be eating and organically grown, it's really not that expensive. I mean, it's much less expensive than processed foods, which are more expensive and essentially more um, harmful to our health. But I would address, really, if I could, <laughs> the enormous subsidies to the meat, dairy, and egg industries, because I think there are no subsidies for soy milk and for rice milk and almond milk, but there are vast subsidies for the dairy industry. The government buys up any excess that the dairy industry produces and then basically dumps it on the school lunch program and forces it onto children 
dumps it into foreign countries. The government actually has now stockpiled over um, a billion pounds of, of non-fat milk, for example, of dry milk. I mean, it, these are huge quantities of, of milk. They just keep buying it and buying it and buying it to support the dairy industry. And, and then stockpiling it and then sending it to, to other countries and encouraging them to take up the dairy habit, which they never would have before. You know, about 80% of the planet uh, population is lactose intolerant. So it's just very ironic to me that a vegan diet, which is essentially much less expensive to produce and much uh, easier to prepare, is actually hard to find and is sometimes people say it's more expensive. <laughs> Basically, it's a 20 to 1. Typically, researchers say it's about 20 to 1. In other words, on a given piece of land and a given amount of water and petroleum, you can feed 20 vegans or one person eating the standard American diet. You know, it's absolutely ridiculous. Right now, we're growing enough food to feed between 12 and 15 billion people on the planet, and we only have, you know, less than 7 billion. So, um, we're growing plenty of food. It's just that we're feeding it to animals in an extremely wasteful, expensive system. And uh, so, um, it's just the opposite. And so who are the ones that are uh, most, you know, benefiting from keeping things this way? <laughs> well, that's pretty obvious. I mean, it's the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media complex. There's a, a powerful elite, uh, obviously, on this planet, which controls most of the corporate industry and uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry and the military uh, industry. The, um, Petroleum industry. These, these industries are, of course, uh, the, the, the top people in those industries are getting a lot of profits from this whole thing. People starving while other people have to, you know, more than they can use. Uh, you know, all of us, the people, I think, uh, if we would wake up and realize this, we could, instead of, you know, railing against the, um, the system, we should simply stop eating animal foods and then we could actually create the changes. So eating animals, you said in your lecture last night at the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii that eating animals is not going to go on much longer and it's just a question of how it will end. Um, could you explain what you mean by that? I believe that there is an awakening happening on this planet. I think that it is possible for us before too long to have a major shift in the way we're living and especially in the way we're treating animals for food. We will not have a major shift in the way we're living if we don't have a, a shift in our, in our food. So one way or the other, uh, these are the last days of eating animals. If we don't stop eating animal foods, if we continue on this, our technologies with so much power for devastation of the environment and of each other, uh, we will certainly destroy ourselves uh, if we don't change the action of eating animal foods and the mentality of violence, of commodification, of disconnectedness, of exploitation, of exclusion that that mentality and that behavior of eating animal foods requires. However, vegans right now are only about 1% of the population and already this 1% is having a huge impact. Everybody, the 99%, they all know what vegans are. They are all aware of it. They may try to cover it up and pretend and wish we would go away or something, but just this 1% is having a huge impact. And this is the true nature. Vegans are simply, you know, veganism is nothing to be proud of. It's simply living our lives the way we were meant to live our lives as compassionate, caring people. And so I think when that 1% becomes 2 and 3 and 4%, as it begins to grow and it begins to spread and it is already doing that, I think when we hit 5%, we will see huge changes in the whole culture. We had 5% of people being vegan. We will start to see a lot more vegan restaurants, a lot more vegan options everywhere, a lot more discussions. I mean, people will start talking about these things. And I think if we got to 10% of the people of the people being vegans, the other 90% would just say, all right, let's do it. You know, And we would just see this a massive change on this planet. Uh, I don't think it's far off. I think it's inevitable. I actually think it's inevitable that we will wake up that this nightmare of violence towards animals, which boomerangs as violence, disease, as a sense of apathy and as low self-esteem in people, and uh, basically the enslavement in many ways of humans, would completely change. And that this is what is on our plate to make a choice. You know that we can make a choice. Every one of us can make a choice when we sit down to eat. 
we can choose to eat foods of cruelty and misery and death and the enslavement of other living beings, which will lead to the enslavement of ourselves, or we can choose a path of compassion and kindness and caring and sustainability and justice and equality, which will lead to the same thing for us, which will lead to social harmony. It's really up to us. It is our choice. And I believe that we will awaken and make the choices that will bring universal peace. Well, we hope that that will happen <laughs> up there. What's the best way that someone can help besides simply changing the food that's on their plate? The most important thing, I think, is for, pe for people to change the food that's on their plate, to m change their behavior, make different choices, and to understand why. To really, you know, I think reading the World Peace Diet and understanding these ideas is enormously helpful. And then, uh, I think that's two things. Number one, it, it helps us as we deepen our, our understanding of this and live it more consequently, then when we speak to other people and we interact with them, however we do, then people will take what we're saying more seriously. Our words will have weight because we're, it's not something we're saying, we're not really acting, you know, we're actually, it's coming from our, the core of our being. And then whatever actions we take, whether we're creating videos, writing articles, talking to people in, in small groups. You know, what people are doing now, uh, all around the country actually, is people are, are doing uh, six to eight week study groups on the World Peace Diet, and just like in their local libraries and churches and community centers, and just discuss, you know, in, in small groups of, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 people discussing the World Peace Diet, having vegan food, getting to know it better, and then doing that over and over again, just spreading these discussions. I think anyone who wants to find out more about this, who wants to um, be more of a proactive uh, blessing in our society um, could begin to just spread the message. Uh, I think using your own skills, whatever they are, if you have skills in writing or in speaking or in music or in art or in education, whatever it is that you can do, whatever your skill is, you can turn it toward this profound benevolent revolution, which is the revolution of compassion, which is what veganism is. So I think the most important thing is to live it deeply and then find out how I can plug in. Uh, I'm happy to work with anyone uh, who wants to give classes in the World Peace Diet. We have a lot of resources online, uh, so that's one possibility, but there are many other possibilities as well. And can you state your websites? Yeah, worldpeacediet.org. Also, worldpeacediet.com and .net, and also Will Tuttle, just my name, .com. It's got the music and the art as well as the World Peace Diet. So, but worldpeacediet.org is the main one. Okay, thank you so much for sharing today, Will. Uh, Dr. William Tuttle, author of The World Peace Diet. As our hearts open to deeper understanding, our circle of compassion naturally enlarges and spontaneously begins to include more and more others. Not just our own tribe, sect, nation, or race, but all human beings. And not just humans, but other mammals and birds, fish, forests, and the whole beautifully interwoven tapestry of living, pulsing creation. All beings all of us. Was there anything in this interview with Will and I that maybe I didn't touch on or that you maybe think that was important? Yeah, one thing, that going vegan is so delicious. <laughs> <laughs> vegan food really is delicious. Some people, when they think about it, they're like, oh, so what do you eat? A carrots and broccoli or something? But really, you can eat Indian food and Thai food and... There are so many possibilities and it's not even difficult. It's, uh, it's pretty easy because also like we travel a lot and meat and cheese, milk, everything goes sour, goes bitter, goes foul. I mean, it's like, why to uh, deal with, with all that? just have these beautiful colorful fruits and vegetables there are so many possibilities and so in your 29 30 years of being vegan what's been the best part the best part is that I can celebrate each meal 
and don't have to think about the horror, which would be if I would have chicken or fish. It's, it's really great and uh, it's creating peace. I like to add that it's really on our plates to do something. I mean, I really talk especially to the parents. If you like to leave a planet for your children, then do something right now. Just clear out your refrigerator. That's what I did, by the way. I went like, like this. From one evening to the next morning, I became a you know, vegan, but I didn't understand about shoes and things, but vegan eating. And it felt great. I needed less sleep. And with global warming, we, we don't have time. Okay, thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you too. It was a pleasure.